Eugene's back and so is Hitler. Tulip is still dealing with some Saint of Killers PTSD and Denis continues to beg his dad to bite him. Hey guys, you won't believe it, I'm actually making this video from hell. We're talking about episode eight of Preacher season two and I wanna know what you guys thought of the episode so hit me up in the comments and also find me on Twitter at RyanEricP. But also you need to subscribe to this channel because we break down more than just Preacher. We're also talking about Rick and Morty, Twin Peaks, and Game of Thrones. <laughs> Episode eight opens up with Eugene working on his summer body and showing off his new tattoo. It's Tracy's name across his back. I'm glad we're back in hell because we get to see more insight into how hell works and all the messed up inmates down here. We also learn that there are levels to hell. By the way, the only candy bar in hell is Zagna, which of course was made famous by Beetlejuice and Hancock and this bear in the great outdoors. Okay, so it's pretty popular in movies and TV, but I've never tried one. If you have, let me know how they taste and where I can find one. Back to hell. Wait, hold up. Do they have to wipe their ass with duct tape in hell? I mean, at least we have gaffer's tape and the basketball is half deflated all the time. This place is horrible. So Miss Mannering walks in, drops the cap to her pen, and the inmate that helps her and picks it up is sent to the hole. She then puts an out of order sign on the vending machine and the caveman gets taped to the TV. A TV just like, just like this one. But it's not really that scary. I guess for a caveman it would be. Then we get a shot of Eugene bullying Hitler and pushing him to the ground. I get it, Eugene has to fit in with the other inmates because good behavior gets you sent to the hole, but I'm not buying his tough guy act. We don't believe you, you need more people. It's no surprise here, but Eugene is the one person that doesn't belong here. He is the sole reason for all the technical difficulties down under and we'll later learn that everyone else in hell deserves their stay. One lady burned her three kids alive, the high school douchebag raped four women, but I really wanna know what the caveman did. Bottom line, Eugene is the only good person down here. Next up, we flash back to a hospital nursery in 1946 where Cassidy looks exactly the same age as he does now. It's because he's a vampire a 119 year old vampire. He's singing a song to his newborn son, his own rendition of Charlotte the Harlot, which is about a prostitute. He then follows with a swig from his flask. Never change, Cassidy. Oh, and his outfit might remind comic book readers of one of his classic looks. Judging by their current relationship, I'd say it's safe to say that Cassidy didn't hold up his end of the promise. Vinny's health continues to fail and Cassidy is trying his best to make him comfortable, but he won't turn him. Shouts to Cassidy for finally downloading a translation app for his cell phone. Tulip, meanwhile, is trying to keep herself and her mind busy ever since the run-in with the Santa Killers. Jesse is in his own world. When he's not searching for God, he's sleeping and vice versa. The only person she has is Cassidy, but he's kind of busy at the moment as well. We then find out that Grell Industries has Team Preacher under surveillance. Featherstone and Hoover, both of whom are in the comics, have been shacked up next door gathering intel on Jesse. And as we know from last week, their boss is on his way. And how about Jesse Custer? Well, his storyline this week was pretty weak. First, he spends most of his time at a knockoff Best Buy examining the God Edition tape for clues. Instead of the Geek Squad, it's the Dork Docs and Jesse spends over half the episode with them, which was completely unnecessary had he just looked at what's literally written on the DVD, Property of Grail Industries. At one point, he's even in a room surrounded by TVs with a Grail Industries commercial. How dense is Jesse that he doesn't even realize all these clues? And second, at one point, Cassidy asks a favor of Jesse to use his power to help out Denis. I was honestly shocked by Jesse's answer. I'm not sure Genesis could help, but even if it could, I just, I, I don't think that's what it's for. All right, of course. I mean, Jesse has used this power on much more trivial things, like macing a guy's balls, or making two cops hold hands. Why exactly can't he help a friend save his son from dying? I think this is going to cause a huge rift in their relationship down the road. Couple that with the obvious love triangle between these characters and it's gonna get messy. On the flip side, the best part of the episode was how the show dealt with Cassidy's current dilemma. He's genuinely conflicted, vulnerable, and distraught over his son's deteriorating health. In no way does he glamorize the life of a vampire. In fact, it seems as if he feels like it's a curse. And there's the boredom. You've heard every joke. Drugs barely work. 
And then everyone you ever cared or loved just, just dies. Except you. Cassidy's been known to be a foul-mouthed, boozed-up, drug-abusing womanizer, but it was refreshing to get new dimension to his character this week and throughout the second season. Back in Hell, and it's Hitler who has a hunch that Eugene is the one who doesn't belong in Hell. He sets him up by tripping the nun. By the way, what did the nun do to get down here? Being the good guy that he is, Eugene is sent to the hole as punishment. That's where things get really uncomfortable. Like, really extremely gross. Even for a show like Preacher. See, in the hole, your own personal hell is even worse than expected. Eugene's hopes are brought to new heights when Tracy tells him that his feelings are mutual. They even hold hands and sing Semisonic's closing time together. I know who I want to take me home. I know who I want to take me home. As funny as that was, remember in the comics, Arseface was a huge Nirvana fan and does in fact become a rock star himself at one point. He could even sing, even if you don't understand what he's saying. But then Jesse shows up in this version of Hell, and he awkwardly hooks up with Tracy in front of Eugene. It was extremely heartbreaking, gross, and f***ed up. Eugene ends this horrible moment by shooting himself in the face. Once he's out of the hole, Hitler tells him that he wants Eugene to help him get out of Hell, so we should expect a Eugene-Hitler team-up in the next coming weeks. Towards the episode's end, Tulip meets a friendly neighbor next door, but it is in fact Featherstone in disguise. I am almost 100% certain they're going to use Tulip to get to Jesse, but in the comics, they used Cassidy to get to him. Speaking of Cassidy, we end with him. While on the phone, we find out Cassidy's first name, which is the same in the comics. Hey, it's Branches. Well, what you want? Money? Uh, it's good to hear your voice, Seamus. Now, Seamus doesn't exist in the comics, but it sounds like Cassidy is extremely close to this person. There's a good chance the fellow Irishman is his older brother who was named William or Billy in the comic books. Based on the questions he's asking, he doesn't think that Denise should be turned because no one really knows what type of vampire he'll turn into. I take Cassidy as a rather well-behaved vampire compared to the other bloodthirsty monsters out there. When he does turn Denny, I have an extremely bad feeling that he will have to put him down himself. On the next episode of AMC's Preacher. The men in white, I don't know how, but they're coming back. You see, that's the power I've been talking about. You work for me now. Yes, sir. I have a date. Kill them all. Clear. I can't tell you why, but I really need to borrow your gun. Now she's armed. We're going to get answers, Cass. I just need one of them alive. The missing puzzle piece.